Hello and welcome to this video and I am absolutely excited to have Carlos Durabi here with us. Hi. He has had an illustrious an illustrious career in the world of dare I say prog. I don't know whether he would like that term. I'm getting I'm getting more comfortable with it. You're, now. you're getting more you get more comfortable with the the the, the prog nomenclature. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's a it's a, it's a it's um a very divisive word, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, it's you know, without without being sort of glib, it's all it. I I you know, it, it's all pop music to me. I mean, you know, it was kind of like when I was eight years old and hearing, you know, really hearing pop music for the first time as as I thought of it, which was what was in the charts. It was the summer of nineteen eighty, where the world went three D and um, anything to me, anything with like drums and singing and dressing up was pop music and I'm given that I'm still doing stuff with drums and singing and dressing up it's still and guitar electric guitars you know then it's still pop music to me so what, what was it haircut 100 what was the I band that got you into prom haircut 100 uh madness oh, depeche mode man. iron maiden stray cats um you know xtc uh the fun boy three uh just everything everything I was into it all I was into everything that was going on uh, and it was for me. It was a, it was a great um, time to come in, nineteen eighty. I mean, I think all all music. I, I mean, you you must have really been into music a little bit earlier than me because nineteen eighty is the key year for me as well. Yeah, that's where and it all starts. Summer of nineteen eighty for me. It was new wave of British heavy metal for me. But the oh, thing is, you've it. you've just mentioned something that anyone around about our age will just gush over. Stray Cats. Oh, that, well, that that was my that was my band. That was oh, my way what a here. band. Yeah, for me, it's and I still. I mean, Brian sets us like Sid Barrett or something. I think you know. For for me, it's like I everything about what that guy was when he appeared, and he's only like twenty one or twenty two. He's you know a virtuoso, but everything he was doing was what I was, was kind of what I wanted to do. Like it was it was like the blueprint. It was the it was the dressing up, dressing in black, eyeliner, you know, virtuoso guitar player standing there fronting a band, just. Everything was correct. And but I, it was I mean, rockabilly, but it wasn't at the same time. I, I mean, I bought their singles when they came out, and there was there was two bands. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was into Angel Witch and and Diamond Head at that point, but um, there were two bands, well, three bands that I really loved as well: The Police, Madness, and Stray Cats. And I bought those yeah. singles. And I've, I, I I know it's your interview, but I've got to tell you a funny story. No, please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might appreciate this. Um, a few years ago, I was having a kitchen delivered by from MFI. And when they delivered it, it was the wrong kitchen and I got annoyed. And so I started having a go at, at, at the guy that had delivered the kitchen. And I noticed he had his hair, he had this big piece of hair that was flopped over to the side. And so that he was getting really angry and his hair was flopping around like this. And I got him so agitated. He turned around to me and he says, I don't even want to do this. I'm a musician. I just want to be out there playing my music. And I said, oh, I'm a musician as well. I said, what do you do? And he goes, I play double bass. I said, what, 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 what in? And he goes, I played double bass for Brian Setzer. Brian yeah. Setzer's bass player delivered my kitchen, the wrong that's kitchen. And then I looked at the floppy really here and I realised it, it wasn't in action. It, it wasn't primed. He was, was that it, ease. Like, Quiff at ease. Yeah, it was at ease. It, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, oh, I've got many man. claims to fame and that is one of them. Wow. Well, You're impressed with that, aren't you? I am impressed. Well, he's my, you know, Setzer's my man, you know. Uh, I've got... Well, you got Got a Gretsch guitar right behind me because of. You Can know. you do all that rockabilly rebel stuff? Uh, not exactly, but um, when I first got that guitar about twenty years ago, I think um, I, I spent about a week just watching. I've got DVDs of like Stray Cats and Brian Setzer Orchestra and, and all that kind of thing, and I spent about a week just watching them and playing along. And if I get my head into rockabilly mode, I can just about fake. I mean, I can play the solo from Stray Cat Strut. You know, but that's about, um, and I can do a few little sets of licks, but not not really. I mean, the funny thing is, I, I have a thing about, about every five years I get a quiff, and so um, I'm probably due one again in a couple of years. I, had I reckon I've, I reckon I, if, if hang on, look, you've, you've got a quiff. Look know. at that, it's it's, it's there. See, I'm prime now. Damn look right. at that. <laughs> and you've got the. I noticed you've got the. Um, you got the uh, shirt outside the collar, so you've. Well, I've got to be honest, because I was interviewing you, I thought Carvis is going to have a psychedelic shirt on, 
and I'm not a, I'm not a very psychedelic looking person. So I put this on for you, and I've all it. I've got the dangly things in. I put this on. This is the best I could do. I should have. You're around. there, like not psychedelic at all. He let me right, down. Right there. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh... For this interview, I'm going to don an amulet. How about that? I, if you had an amulet, I, I'm not. You see, I haven't really got into this interview properly because there's no amulet there. You, you, you know, I was expect there. Now, now we, now, now we're now, talking. Now, now we're talking. Now I, I am become shaman. Oh, well, well, I, I'm, I can't stop looking at it. Now it's drawing me. <laughs> yes, it's the third eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, shall we get serious then? So, yeah. um, for those of you who don't know your list career, do you want to just have a, a recap of what you've done and what you what you're doing at the moment? And um, I just quickly, I came to London in the early '90s with a band from Plymouth called the Monsoon Bassoon, um, which is still one of my favourite things. I don't like the name, terrible name, but um, still one of my favourite things sort of ever done, really. And I think that band really sort of um, we were sort of, we put our first album out in 99, some singles in 98. It started in the mid nineties and finished in about 2001. And um, for me, what we did in that band from starting until the end, pretty much sort of set up, I think everything I've done in my thirties and forties and now fifties since really. And I suppose that's sort of, um, I don't know how you describe it. I suppose, prog, <laughs> it's yeah. kind of rehearsal intensive, but also, always you know was really drawn to music that's got a you know feels that's got an edge or a charge to it or something and uh monsoon sort of there, there was definitely i don't know there was something quite incendiary about the that band and sort of always always wanted that from from music and what was the influences on that band what what, what oh all sorts i mean it was uh the, the big well gong actually um and i suppose we all came through cardiacs we've been cardiacs fans and tim recorded us and produced us um, a lot of what was around at the time that we were really into is a band called Shudder to Think that was a really big one for us. Um, stuff like, I suppose, um, Steve Reich was a big influence on that. Uh, Henry Cow. And then stuff like No Means No and Big John Zorn, Naked City kind of fans as well. And XTC. So, and you sort of Sid Barrett. And it was like just a mixture of everything we were listening to. But also, we moved to London at the time that the kind of drum and bass was just being born really i sort of uh i kind of missed out a little bit on uh kind of techno and rave i don't say i missed out on it i was quite into it i was sort of um you know in my late teens when that was happening in plymouth and there was quite a big rave scene in plymouth so i was always kind of liked it but i was that was the time i was really getting into things like sort of gong and um henry cow and fred frith and it's kind of jazz sort of stuff but when we moved to london there was this real Sort of explosion of the kind of drum and bass thing and we were we were living in hackney where it was happening and specifically the bass player laurie um um who now records under the name apple blim sort of dubstep stuff but the bass player laurie and the drummer jim were really really into it and so that really started informing the music so we were you know me and dan were writing these kind of angular riffs in sort of 11 8 with kind of strange vocal harmonies over the top and then those guys would be like just sort of drawing influences from sort of drum and bass. And what rhythm, specifically, really... what acts was that be at the time? With... Well, um, well, there was the, the stuff we were really into was like sort of plug, which is like Luke Viber kind of stuff. Yeah. And then also it was that kind of stuff from like Reflex and the kind of um, warp that we were really into, sort of like uh, the Aphex. So it wasn't it wasn't specifically like sort of uh, the, the, the jungle stuff so much as the jungle influence stuff. And then I remember, um, God, I'm trying to think what we were buying. You have to speak to Laurie and Jim about this, but um, I remember Spring Hill Jack and sort of Omni Trio and um, yeah. like I'm trying to say, uh, Fotec was um, another thing around at the time. And they, they were really, really into that. So they were, they were trying to sort of, not that, probably if you listen to the Montes, you can hear it, but um, it sort of added a, an interesting thing because, uh, because I mean, the, one, one of the great things I thought about the whole drummer bass thing is it seemed like kind of more like, well, with that, it seemed more like jazz, and then the stuff like Aphex and Square Push and Orteca seemed like prog to me. I mean, oh, so, this, this is why I would I, I I pursued this discussion because being the same age as me, I grew up as a big prog fan, and then that yeah. dance music thing happened. And what you had was this sort of house music coming from America, which was sort of a gay disco thing. Yeah. And when it lands in England, it gets this sort of new age traveler prog thing, and suddenly. Yeah. 
and, and, and suddenly you get this sort of gong aesthetic that I've known about all my life seem to then permeate everything. And it, it all goes like gong. Well, and then, then you, then you, you get, get System of... 7 and you get like all... And I felt that that period in the early 90s was like a second progressive rock era. But it, I mean, it, it was. I mean, it, it kind of, when you listen to... I mean, I, mean, I remember when... Um, I keep going back to Square Pusher, but I remember when Feed Me Weird things came out and just the, the level of programming and just the, the insane, almost like uh, just attention to detail. Insane. No computer as well. No was, computer. Oh, honestly, and Max Tundra, who was a friend of ours, was doing the same thing with total prog stuff. But it was constantly modulating music, shifting meters all the time. It really, it really seemed to be coming from the same place that, People who yeah, I, I I feel this, and the, th the thing is, is that people go, oh, the golden age of prog, nineteen seventy three, close to the edge in the charts, dark side of the moon because selling out, you know. And I go, yeah, but in the early nineties, the same thing. The orb would come out with something that was pretty much like gong influenced twenty minute track. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like something off you, and it goes to number one in the singles yeah. charts, and then you add with, like with a, with a sample of Pat Metheny's um, doing Steve Reich's electric counterpoint in there, you know, absolutely mad. And then it's I can remember reading into with Goldie, and he he was basically a, a graffiti artist. He was up the road from me, and then he goes on holiday, and he he is Pat Metheny, and Pat Metheny, and then he goes and does that, you know, uh, Inner City Life album, which is like got a twenty minute drum and bass epic on it. These are prog tracks, and then the rock bands pick up on it. And Radiohead comes, you know, this post sort of grungy indie band suddenly turn into, you know, Pink Floyd basically because they're listening to all the warp stuff and listening to Square Pusher and uh, absolutely mad. I mean, it was a mad time because that was so that was the background against which like Monsoons was was operating. Yeah, I really thought that. Well, I mean, it, for me, it was a, well, I, all periods of music are great. I don't think any, I don't think any one genre or any one era can lay claim to making. The best music. I mean, there's always brilliant stuff happening because the people you all have you always have people who want to make really far out music, you know. So um, nine eight seven was rubbish. Like though. Huh? Rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mel and Kim. That was the best thing they had in nine eight. That was cool. Uh, music, no, uh, get fresh. The uh, They were good. Day, 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 no, it's brilliant. I, I lament, um, not that I have a TV anymore, but I lament, um, and, and this is probably why, I lament um, I lament Top of the Pops going because I always watched it, even going right into the 90s. Just can't, oh, That was my my fix on a Thursday evening if I, if I was in. All through my life I was watching Top of the Pops, you know, and it was, uh, I, I miss I miss being able to at least have a, a little bit, even if it was just a little finger in kind of what was what's going on. Because I have no idea about what's Sort of being released now, but um, now I haven't. But you, you represent the thing which is which there's there's prog, which is a, a style, and then there's prog, which is an attitude. And in, when you have the prog attitude, anything can come into the mix. You can bring in anything you want. You seem to just love. And, and I was like this when I was younger. I got got a bit stayed in my way when I was younger. I was listening to absolutely everything. I would just all welcome it all in. Yeah. You know, and then you know, I think this is such a positive thing that you could take from it, absolutely anything. So, um, you yeah, carry on with the story because one of the things that's interesting with you, as you start to tell this story, I was I was having a chat with the great Mark Mondesi, Mond Mondesi, who was one of the great British jazz drummers yesterday, and he was talking to me about manifestation. And the idea when you visualize something, it sort of comes true because you've yeah. got all the two influences, the two influences you started with, with cardiacs and gong. You've been you've ended up associated with both of those bands. I know, but until until I until I join Iron Maiden, I, ain't, I don't believe in it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got my I've got my uh, there's my so I've got my uh, there, there's the stray cats guitar and I've got the uh I've got the Iron Maiden guitar here as well, you know. So. Oh, look at that! That's a beauty. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I know that's true. No, I, I. I was talking to. Do you know Mike Venart at all? Um, okay, so Mike Venart, another progger. He was in a. His band was called Ocean Size. Oh yes, I know that. I had their albums. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're amazing. He's you know he's one of my 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 best friends really, and um, you know we're both we're we're both on this crazy sort of journey together um and and he talks a lot about manifest you know manifestation and, and making things happen and one of them was getting um 
for him was getting Dave Lombardo from Slayer to play in his new band, you know, which, which he now has, you know, and he said, just put it out there and it happened kind of thing. It is true. So how did that happen for you then? Well, I, it, I think I don't, I think I've only become sort of conscious of it the last few years, really, of I've, once I started giving it a name, um, you know, calling it magic. Mm. And then it, it it's like anything. I think it's like, if you, you know, if, if you choose to see the world as um how can i put this if, if you see the world as being a, a a ghastly and negative place uh you know ruled by an uncaring god who only has it in it for you for, for you to fuck up then everything that happens bad to you you're gonna that's gonna be true you know that that's how you're gonna read the world if you if those are your lenses that's how you'll see the world by the same token if you say that you could say that well the world is you know the work the work the world is this really uh you know governed by a, a kind God who makes everything good happen to me. And if, if that's how you see the world, that'll happen to you as well. You know, it really is how you see it. And it's, I just started to think, well, how about if this isn't all a uh, coincidence and these are synchronicities and that actually everything you do and, you know, everything you put out into the world has sort of has consequences and they come back to you. And sort of you, if you, you, you know, you know, you're always trying to steer yourself in the, in, in the right direction. I'm not articulating this very much. But you're no, always, you've gone very philosophical. Philosophical. You know, you're I always think. trying to to point the nose of the craft, as it were, in the right direction. So all the micro decisions you make, you you know, on a day to day basis, you're making to to hopefully, you know, achieve some sort of or get to some sort of end goal, which is hopefully to, to take be able to take your art further or to get deeper into your art or whatever it is you're doing. And I think if you just sort of you know that 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 then becomes a way of like everything you know everything you do sort of becomes geared towards that. And I, and I don't, it's not not making much sense, but um. No, I I I, I think you've 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 hit on something which if is there any musicians watching this or artistical creative people, and we're all creative to some extent. But I think you've hit on something that I really believe in too. And I'm I I I was a bit of a Gurdjieffian. I was a Gurdjieff. Yeah when I was probably when I was younger and he used to talk about a thing called magnetic center and and I really I really believe in this and it's hard to maintain I've had certain points in my life when I can't maintain it and there's other points I can and it it's um it it it's it it's very similar to something my dad's told me he said that and this was a much more scientific thing he said we have this thing called this I think he said it was called the recticular activation uh, system in our body and the way he described it he said if you drive into a car park and there's no spaces it switches on and then your system is very sensitive he said you might just see a, a an exhaust pipe suddenly wobble and oh that car started oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And, and and that 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 thing of of, of, of basically shutting off the, the moral side which is saying this should be like this and that's the negative thing why is my life not this it should be like this once you open your eyes you could see where the car parking space is because it's all there in front of you. Yeah. And it's and it does link to this idea of magic, you know, which I mean Alistair Crowley then he had this idea that magic was basically being so sensitive to the world around you that you could spot what's going to happen next almost. That that's it. That's exactly it, I think. And I think it, it you know, it it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, imbued with this sort of supernatural you know supernatural area it is just it it is just like almost like navigating a path through circumstance in a way yeah consequence and trying to see well what what would be the best path you know uh and so and then things do happen things that you you would like to happen just sort of seem to happen i think you know and then and did you find that um you know as as i mean because like you said you were you, you were a, a massive Cardiacs fan and then you find your band is being produced by, you know, Tim and then you become a roadie for them and then eventually you join that band. Um, How yeah, did that happen? How did that all come about, that that journey towards that? I mean, in a way, it's it's quite it's quite sort of... Um, I suppose it's quite simple. Is it uh, Because I, I heard Cardiacs when I was 16, um, A Little Man in a House and the Whole World Window came out and I heard it and it, it, it just, you know, it, it blew my mind, but the best way I can put it is it's um I I never knew that that, that was the music that I needed until I heard it it was like it, it accessed some part of me that I didn't know was there but as soon as it did it plugged into it I realized this was it it it, it nourished me in a way that even stuff like Stray Cats and Iron Maiden hadn't you know there'd always been this there'd always been elements of 
like there's a particular bit in the Stray Cat song that had such a charge to it. And I, I couldn't believe it. And when I was a kid, you almost seemed to, you know, change the natures of the time. Was I just used to play this bit again and again. It wasn't but it wasn't until I heard Cardiacs where I realized the whole the whole all the music had this charge. And it seemed to be coming from somewhere like just completely otherworldly. And it seemed to really tie into dreams and the the eternity and just the, the magical ideas it, it had a sort of supernatural quality cardiacs and hearing it I, the, the more i found out about it over the, the next few months i i sort of i didn't become convinced that tim and i were going to be friends exactly but i knew i knew there was there had to be some connection there because this music affected me so incredibly deeply but more on a practical level the kind of music that i was me and dan um, from monsoons were going into because we were sort of in a metal band at the time called I have to say it in a Plymouth accent die laughing we were in, it's, <laughs> die laughing it's die laughing sounds because <laughs> everyone in Plymouth called it die laughing so we were in this like metal band at the time but it, it, it was starting to become more and more proggy and more psychedelic started to work in different meters and you know we were very influenced by what well, cardiacs and voivod and hawkwind and I suppose just you know what was going on we were into at the time and um it just, it just out of practicality i realized that, it, that the once we started making funny music it, it, there weren't that many people in plymouth that really it really landed with you know that was just not where people in plymouth were at and meanwhile i was going up to see cardiacs a lot in london uh there was playing all the time in the late 80s and early 90s and when i was up there it just seemed to be this real like coterie of really cool bands around them there was that band uh, levitation um and then miranda sex garden who's <laughs> i'm now joined but they were friends and then city busai and um god i don't, don't want to forget any bands but there was this little sort of gaggle of bands in london that seemed to be mates with tim and around and there was a fanzine uh called uh, the organ um that we're used to reading. it seemed that like a lot of very cool for want of a better word, like angular, proggy kind of punky bands were happening in in London and East London, and I just thought, well, this 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 is the place we need to be. You know, I didn't want to. I sort of felt that we'd have musically outgrown Plymouth, and certainly I was. Plymouth's a, you know, I don't want to don't want to talk smack on the town I grew up in, but it's it's not really it's not generally somewhere to sort of make music because it's so stuck out in the southwest, and you know, I wanted to I wanted to give you know my music, you know. As shitty as it was back then, when I was 21, I wanted to give it the best possible chance and opportunity. And so London seemed to be the place to be. And I knew I wanted to gravitate towards, um, you know, towards Tim and that the scene around him, such a sort of magnetic character and just seemed to have these amazing, like, characters and people around him. So ultimately, you know, we did we did meet each other. I, I met him, a, a, you know, just to chat to you off, you know, before a couple of cardiac shows. But you know, once we came to London and sort of found ourselves at the same gigs and he came to see my band, um, the Monsoon Bassoon, I think a friend, we were supporting Bill Drake and a, a friend of ours had given, had played Tim our cassette and he really liked it apparently. So he came to see us and we, and you know, through a moment of, let's say synchronicity, I saw one of the texts. I was, I was at college studying um, in Wandsworth, studying music technology and I saw, um, uh, I saw like one of the stage texts in my local pub in Hackney and um, I just you know we, we, we had a few drinks together started chatting and I just sort of said well you know if Cardiacs ever needs a guitar tech you know he got my number I've, I'd never guitar tech in my life and about a week later I came back from college and my girlfriend said you're not going to believe it Tim Smith just rang up you know uh, and uh, they're going on tour in a couple of weeks with Chumbawamba and they're looking for a guitar tech so there, there it began you know and then me and Tim sort of became really good friends. And um, after that, it sort of seemed kind of inevitable when John couldn't do, um, when John couldn't do Cardiacs anymore uh, because he, because of his commitments with Wild Hearts, it just, it, it was just sort of inevitable, I suppose, you know, by that time, me and Tim had been close for about, you know, probably five or six years, you know, or more. Or more. It's, it's, so, uh, it, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a story that explains how you get the gig. But I think the reason why we're fascinated by these stories is because when you step back, you, you're you like almost born with this um, uh, desire towards some aesthetic thing that you can't put into words. 
and then you see the kernel of it in the stray cuts which is absolutely yeah. stray you see it there and then that takes you on a journey and it then it takes you to cardiacs and then that your life whole structure of your life is then is is channeled down this mysterious thing that you have as a kid of searching for what this thing that you can't put into words i had it with the mavish orchestra i was i went through iron maiden angel which then yes elp and i was going through all these bands and i there was something in all of them and when I heard the Mavish Nocturne, Birds of Fire, and I put that track on, I remember sitting there thinking, this is it, I found it. That's beautiful, that record, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's like last week, I'm sat there talking to Billy Cobham, telling him, because I interviewed Billy Cobham last week, and I was telling him about the very specific things that happened to me related to him, because it was Billy Cobham that took me to the Mavish Nocturne, um, that very specific weird things that happened to me, because when I started drumming, um, when I was 12, I was listening to like White Stake and Rainbow. That was what I was into at the time. I wanted to be like Cozy Powell. And I, I yeah, still yeah. like Cozy Powell, really. Yeah, me too, yeah. And I, I, I always wanted to be a drummer, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, Coz, Cozy was the coolest guy. Great drummer. So I saw the, him play with Sabbath, actually, of all. Did you? Yeah, at Cornwall Coliseum. in like, they were doing that album, T-Y-R, T Tia, you know. And uh, Neil Murray, Cozy Powell, Powell and um, Tony, uh, Tony uh, the Cat. Uh, Martin on vocals. I met him the other day. <laughs> I, met, I met Tony Martin the other day because I, I really? played on a record with Tony Martin and I never met him. And then he he was at the, I was watching what what gig did I go to see? It might have been Life Signs actually. It might have been at the oh, Life right. Signs. Wow. And then somebody said that's Tony Martin. Then I mean I said I've just played on a track with you. The cat is he called the cat? Is he Tony the cat? Wasn't that his? Didn't he have a? You know. I don't know about this. I don't know about this. It's like I, I've always wanted to be the something, <laughs> and I've never been able to achieve that. So you've got to take your hat off him to be to be that. And a cat's a good thing to be. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to be a badger. But Andy the Badger Edwards. I'm, I've said it now, and hopefully this video will. Uh... Badge. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go on to just been chatting to the badge. <laughs> <laughs> it's the whiteness here. You see, yeah, I'm getting very badgery. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Badger's my spirit animal. So yeah, I, I I love a badger, and my garden has been it's been ravaged by a badger. He's been causing all sorts of terrible things, and then a few weeks ago, I come out and he, the badger was dead, lay out in front of my house, and, and I went. I was really upset about it because although he was causing you trouble, you were talking about manifestation. Did you manifest this death into being? You know? Yeah, well, I, I stood over him. Maybe there's some of that his spirit has now passed into me, which is why I've just said that to you. And it's all it's all the same thing. But this is this is nonsense. But the fact of what we were talking about before, that this thing of aesthetics, really, when you step back, becoming for some people the the guiding principle of their life and the direction you go down. And and I found art has 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 provided so much positivity to me. I think without it, I would have been mentally very unstable as well so yeah yeah i think a lot of people are <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so it's an important thing so what about the gong thing because now you are fronting gong one of the most important greatest bands in the history of mankind so what's that like i don't want to uh, intimidate you with your uh your um the quest that you have been given bequeathed yeah <laughs> it's bequeathed. like i mean it's that there's there's so many different ways of you know, looking look, looking at it, and it and it, it is such a strange thing. And, and the deeper we get into it, um, the 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 more facets of it I start to not exactly understand, but to sort of notice. And uh, it, it, the the newest one, which are Fabio sort of said, we've just so we've just finished the tour, um, uh, the first half of this sort of UK tour we're doing with Osric Tentacles, where we're sort of swapping headliners, um, and. Um, you know, it's a, it's a new set we're doing, and it, each time we get deeper into this thing, it, it it sort of it kind of reveals more about itself. And one of the things that Fabio, the other guitar player, said it, that makes this band so good, I think, and so unique, is that none of us have any ownership over it. And even even if, for example, even if one of the members was, um, let's say it was like Matt, Mike Howlett or Steve Hillage, you know, both of whom are, are pals and that we've played with, that they, they may feel, I'm not saying they would, but they it, they may feel that they had some sort of more ownership of the band than we did because they 
stretching back to you know the seventies. However, because we're sort of um, not exactly Johnny Come Lately, because we were we were given this band, you sort of operate in a completely different way because we didn't start it, but it's our band now. It's our music. It's a hundred percent our music and our ideas and our production and everything. But you sort of treat it differently. I can't I can't quite put my finger on it. And then the other thing is, it's just been this kind of, you know, platform, but taking away just the name Gong and what, what that represents and, you know, what, you know, how how you read that, you know, and, and, and what that means to people. Just at, to, to be five musicians um, playing, I, I, I think, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm everything I do, I'm trying to improve. I'm trying to become a, a better singer. I'm trying to become a better performer, a, a better guitar player, a better composer, a better producer, a better, you know, illustrator. I, I just want to keep improving. And I think all the members of the band are, are like this. So I think everybody at this point in their lives is playing the best they've ever played. And I feel incredibly per privileged to be up to be, be playing with like a sax player like Ian East and a, a bass player like Dave, a drummer like Cheb, uh, like a guitar player, and Meister, master gliss player like Fa Fabio. Just to, to to get to play with these people just makes me want to be as good as I can and to be absolutely in in a position where I'm able to deliver the best I possibly can. So it's a whole new thing. Who knew? But I don't drink before gigs uh, now. Not that I ever played. I never used to play drunk, but I always have a, like a couple of pints before a show because of nerves or something. But now I, um, the last uh, two years with Gong, I don't drink and I just I just spend about an hour and a half before we walk on. I'm doing an hour and a half of just playing before. So the minute we hit the stage, I'm just really hopefully in the in the in the best state possible. And and also, you know, bringing bringing magic into it, sort of, you know, I I see each um each, every single performance. I see it as, as almost like a, a ritual of transformation, both for the audience and for the band. And we have these, you know, we have these different variables. We have the five musicians and the vocal harmonies, which is a new thing for Gong. And I really, really, you know, we're really into like harmony vocals, sort of beach voice kind of vibe. Um, and then you've got this extraordinary light show with fruit salad and we've just got this brilliant front of house and we're, we're doing the, trying to get the best sound and the best visual thing we possibly can. And to, to us or, or to me, certainly I'm seeing the whole thing as like a, a magic ritual of, of transformation. Now, whether or not the, the audience, whether or not you think that's complete bollocks doesn't matter. What matters is that I'm going to it thinking it of, thinking of it like that. And but I'm it's, it's that true psychedelia, isn't it? It's psychedelia. Just complete, we're all going to come out of this change. Yeah, you know? I think psychedelia is is about transformation, isn't it? Essentially, and I think that um, all my favourite bands that it's not that they write great songs. It's what they do. Is they create their own universe, and once yeah. you can hit, inhabit, Cardiacs are one of those bands. Frank yeah. Nippers like that. Yeah, and um and gonga like that it's a yeah. it's a world you enter into and and then the thing i think the nature with gong is it is that gong seems to they do they do that trilogy which is insane it's like an incredible achievement which i don't think three albums that tell this insane story you know um going up to you which is one of the greatest albums ever made in the history of all albums and then gongs seem to shatter into all these different aspects. And I love them all because there was always this thing, you know, like Floating Anarchy, which is like the punk gong, you know. And then you've got um, Pierre Molon's, um that sort of jazz fusion. I, I love Gazors. I think it's one of no. my favourite Holdsworth albums. I think it's, it's one of the greatest jazz fusion albums of all yeah, time. Yeah, I think it's, it's beautiful, yeah. And that, and, the, and I and I look at it and I go, that trilogy of Gazia's Expresso and then uh, Time is the Key all with Alan Holdsworth on them. There's another trilogy there. And um, in, in much the same way as my friend Greg Bendian, who he's now doing the Mavish new project, he sees it as, it, it's it's almost like, uh, it, it's it's a it's a world, it, almost like jazz musicians play, will play jazz standards almost. It's, it's a world that you can enter into. And so when he does the Mavish new project, which is the closest thing I think to my world of being a Mavish. Because that's another thing. Mavish knew you just, there's a vibe to it. King Crimson have it. Yeah. They've got their own stink, I think, of, you know. That's yeah, yeah, I, yeah. But with Gong, especially, um, you know, I, obviously, it, it, David Allen, it was, it, he is Gong, but 
it there's a history of it of him not being there in so many different aspects. And so I always saw Osric Tentacles and um and the orb as as being a side shoot of Gong. And this is something that's really weird. Another Gong album, speak, New York Gong. You know, speak you know New speak. York Gong with Bill yeah, Laswell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That then opens up that material, Bill Laswell, practice, Massacre. yeah, yeah, and then John Zorn, Naked yeah. City, and so I, I see channels of, of stuff. So the some of the some of the Bill Laswell stuff has a gong. It uh, it's gone to me. You I know, think it was, I, that, it's funny because between I think probably the the most formative years in terms of. Uh, um, what really wired up my what rewired my DNA sort of in terms of music was probably t- for me between the age of being 16 and 21. So it was like 1988 to sort of, um, and I moved to London when I was 21. So about say 88 to 1993 was really where I was starting to, you know, drink deep of drink deep of this stuff. And then, and that was when, you know, it starts with cardiacs and then, then it explodes into, you know, yes, crimson gong, uh, Faust, Henry Cow, Robert Wyatt, uh, Hatfield in the North, and then with the American stuff like for me, like Voivod as well, and then like the American stuff like Sonic Youth, Shudder to Think, Canada No Means No, and uh, then things like Mr. Bungle I really liked. But then also the the big thing was the whole um, you know, the John Zorn and everything related to the, anything related to Naked City, so like Bill Frizzell or um, you know Joey Barron, the stuff he was doing. And then all the all the kind of um, Masada stuff that Zorn was doing and of course moving to London when I was 21 it just it kind of opened up all those you know, the incredible record shots and um, there used to be a great sort of like um, I think it was related to This Heat and Henry Cow shot down in um, Stockwell called These Records and I got all stuff like Cheer Accident and Magma and Skeleton Crew and all the Frith related stuff and it just seemed like this real world of I, I called it. I, I wrote a little bit about this, and, and I called it like uh, following the bent path. It seemed like this music was all, all part of this bent path. It all, it's way. all sort of disjointed, and it doesn't, it doesn't seem to line up. But what you're describing is exactly how I see it, and I see these links that then go through to Bootsy Collins and Parliament Funkadelic, yeah. and then another world there, and then you've got links. Through to well, that uh, like gong. I mean, the orchestra gong. I mean, there's another. Well, no, uh, there, yeah, there's gong, another. There's a, and it's it it. I I know, I know I know exactly what you mean. It's really interesting, and the strangest thing, um, what you're talking about is this. Then you get that line to sort of magma and all that stuff, which has brought you to probably the thing that has brought you the most media attention, is forming a band oh, with the snooker player Steve Davis. Yeah, I, 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 I really, I'm saying this now on video. I want Steve on my channel at some point. Oh, I'm sure he'd love it. He'd be very happy. To because I, 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 I'm because <laughs> totally separate to my music love. I hate sport. Yeah, same. same. Hey, but I love snooker. Are you going to? I that? love snooker. Yeah. I was a yeah. massive yeah. snooker fan. I always I was. Always was. And it's the most psychedelic of game. I'm. I'm of course. Not- it- it's oh, the, I love it. <laughs> you mean, you pulled awesome it all people. together. <laughs> no, it totally is. It's the most psychedelic of all the of the games to me anyway. And I will I will sit there and watch game after game after or, or match frame and just keep watching. It's so meditative. And what I would say to people who don't get snooker, it's almost like you have to you have to change your brain waves. Because I, I I don't like it's cool if people like football. For me, I don't like I don't like the sound of it. I don't like the sound of that and the color of it's really horrible snooker's really serene and there's a there's a narrative between the ted low ted you remember ted low the the narrator for pop black oh right yeah yeah and now kirk stevens approaching the sound of the ball you know the sound of the balls watching the physics of the thing watching the thing play out and i'll just sit there with my guitar and then i love the just a quiet commentary and it's almost like you have to i don't know like adjust your brain waves to 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 like and once you become absorbed in this thing it's really hypnotic and really mesmerizing i can watch hours of it you know i i I can remember being very ill in 2014 very ill and i've got a chest infection it was turning into pneumonia but it didn't turn into pneumonia because i sat in front of the snooker and the snooker just i can remember as soon as it was on my brain pattern went on to a certain 
it's 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 like intense focus, but it's meditative snooker is. And of I course, the I mean, there's a number of geniuses for me. I mean, Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie I mean, I, Ronnie, but Steve Ronnie. Davis. I mean, that guy. Before we get onto the music and his in, in him, you know, Steve Davis was an absolute god for me at, through that period and that match with Dennis Taylor. That that was like where snooker just got to that peak, you know, and he he was something else. And I've 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 said this so many times that um, when you go through this in the eighties and then you start to realize that. Steve Davis is spending his money propping up magma. <laughs> I don't know how much when I was said it in the right. Uh, that he, he put on a he put on two shows in yeah, there. Yeah. What was it wasn't technically magma; it was offering, but it was like the sort of post. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm saying that in a facetious, jokey way. Just the idea of like, what you're going to do with the winning, Steve. I'm going to yeah. spend it on magma. <laughs> well, we knew we knew he liked sort of like funny music. Um, you know, when we were growing up, we'd heard, oh, no, he's into, like, you know, he's into sort of like Gong and Magra and, and stuff. But um, what the, the funny thing is, is that as, as strange as it seems on paper or from a distance about being in a group with Steve and, and all that kind of thing, you know, knowing Steve uh, as I do, you know, and, and have done for a, a number of years now, and, um, and um, is that... I now see. I didn't know. I well, I did know. We were friends when he was a snooker player, but it was it was at the end of his career. You know, we we start, first started hanging out in sort of mid two thousands. Um, but what I will say is, when I, I see his focus and how sort of obsessively he'll get into something, and regardless of what it is, he gets really obsessive about it, which is, I completely relate. Yeah, to. I, I got, I, I took, I went, saw an interview with Steve Davis when I was a kid, when I was practicing the drums and he said this thing about offsetting like second order desire and putting that thing you want over there. You know, so said if he was hungry, you'd get the sandwich and stick it in the side of the room. And then he would practice and practice till he achieved what he wants. And then he would eat the sandwich. Right. I didn't and, know I, and I and I call that money in the bank. And I say it to my students, I, I, this is the power of this man. And I and I haven't even got onto the the album, the the, the Utopia Strong album. I I I had passed from Shane Embry from to Napalm. I think, God, check this album out. A few months ago, I was being passed on the. It's incredible. It's incredible which one, stuff. Which one? Which one have you got? I don't know. It's got it's black with dots on the front. Black with dots on the front. That my um that my, the first one because we've done two studio albums now, one sort of blue. I, I've got them over there. Yeah, mine's that. in the car at the moment. I've just started listening to it. You know, we, I, I really. I mean, <clears throat> the second album we did uh, was it last? I think it was last year. Uh, called International Treasure. For me, for me, the title track, which is the um, penultimate tune on the album, the the, the title track, International Treasure. For me, is I, I think what the closest I've got to a, you know, to a certain thing that I've been aiming at musically. It was like one of the ones where if I died, or or I can go well, that's what I meant. That that's what I was trying to get to. And this, I've got this pantheon of like maybe five or six tunes in a certain style or a certain kind of righteousness to them. Yeah, and I've always wanted to be able to to be able to humbly be able to just say look and here's my contribution to this sort of thing and finally that's the, the international treasures the closest i got where i go well no, it's it's it's, 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 it's absolutely i mean hearing that the other day i thought oh, i've got to talk to this guy now and i and i i, I felt that I, I, I you know how much is the fact that steve davis is in the band obscuring the fact that this is incredible stuff you know do you, i mean it's a there's been a big media thing but it's like you know um, and I'm sure people are listening to it because it's Steve Davis has done this album, but does it actually affect people's perception of it? You know, in um, some... interestingly, I think it, it might have done at the very beginning, um, but we found our people. I think the band is probably as big or as, as small as, as it always would have been making sort of some pretty, um, whatever you want to call it, maximalist ambient music or something rather, rather than sort of minimalist. But um yeah, I think at first, uh, the first record, obviously, that was the story. But ultimately, you know, um, people are going to like it, respond to it if they do respond to it and not if they don't. And interestingly, if you look at not that he posts on Twitter anymore, I don't think, or maybe does. But if you look at Steve's Twitter feed, for example, if he if he does a post about um, like 
something to do with like what's going on in the snooker. He gets hundreds of likes and retweets and loads of engagement. If he writes about, oh, me and Carvis are DJing or is the new uh, Utopia Strong thing, it gets the same amount of the, the, if I'd have posted that or if Mike had posted it. You know, we've we've just got our people. I don't think that, I think even in the, even in the snooker world of his friends, like Ken Doherty and... Um, uh, <laughs> it's weird this conversation I've had on one channel. <laughs> I think they just think he's weird. I don't think they've heard any of his music. <laughs> it's like know. we're switching between like Steve Reich, Hawkwind, and then Ken Duckett. Yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I just I love it. It, it. it proves there's a god. I mean, I'm I I not that I'm not that religious, but the fact that your band exists, that Steve Davis has this band with you proves that the world cannot be what we think it is on the surface. There's something going on, which is strange. Well, Steve's a kind of, I mean, Steve's a pretty one-off guy. I mean, as are we all, but, you know, he's a pretty one-off guy. But I think the point I was, I was sort of trying to make, but not very well, was that having seen how he approaches, like, his instrument and and, and the obsessive sort of way he thinks about it and, and everything to do with it, I totally understand why he became this, you know, world champion in the 80s. I could see that him, you know, you, you witness that focus. It's like, okay, I could see how you could put that focus on like this game and get that good at it. You know, he's a pretty remarkable mind, that guy. So, if you'd gone out for, to the pub with him, because I didn't think the other day, we got there very early and there was a snooker table. And I used to play snooker, I was never very good, even though I loved it so much. I never was very good. And me and my mate said, let's have a game of snooker, my drum tech, actually. And we we got on this snooker table and had a game of snooker. And I think after about three hours, we'd scored about 14 points between us. It was a terrible thing. What? How How good is he now? If he went into the pub, you know, would he beat, would he beat, say, the person that he, you know, if he went up and yeah, said, game of yeah, pool? He would. I mean, I see him. I, see I love him. it. <laughs> he'll do things like, you know, he'll play with, he'll play with, um, sometimes with the DJing that we do, They'll say, oh, will you come and play a, a couple of players at pool, whatever. But if it's, you know, I, I've seen him like throw matches just to let the other person win. Oh, I love this. They I love go back and say, got this you know, but I, I, know, <laughs> I know what he's doing. I would just love to see him destroy somebody now. I would I love him. I'll be so happy on a gig. You know that musicians sing. I oh, should we have a game of pool. We got we got an hour. What you know? You've got fifty p. Yeah, let's have a game of pool. But you got Steve Davis and the bloody band. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. And then there's one more thing I've got to ask you. But is even more weird than this is the fact that on Wikipedia it says that your most proudest moment was being given a satchel by Fiona Bruce. I, I told I asked someone to put that up there. Yeah, I thought that was such a, a sort of ludicrous story. That, it's not um, true, is it? It is true. It's completely. It is true. Yeah. It's a Harry Potter satchel. And I, well, I've still got the other one. I had got two. I sold one on uh, eBay. So um, I was uh, I was a painter decorator for about um, twenty five years, and um, uh, I was doing Fiona Bruce's place in the. I tell you when it happened. Because why it happened was the bombing in London. So it's 2007, I think. That's why I was doing it. Um, and she, uh, her husband had um, worked as a producer of some films and had some sort of promotional items, two of which were these uh, promo kind of leather satchels. Uh, one was for the film Troy, uh, which I think, I think I still have, and one was for uh, Harry Potter. And she said, do you want these? I said, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> And I thought, oh, I've got to put that on Wikipedia. Just to, it's such a ludicrous, uh, ludicrous. I, fact. Yeah, I, did, I thought you were going to say, oh, we made that because I got someone on uh, to put on my Wikipedia that I designed my own door knocker. Oh right, <laughs> but I haven't. That was just being, you know, that was not true. I think I just put it on Twitter. I said, can someone please put on Twitter? Was once given a, a satchel by Fiona Bruce, and then they said done. So. Uh... Well, <laughs> Oh, the treasured possession. And the fact it's a Harry Potter so has it got it, it's not it hasn't got the name Harry Potter on it, has it? It's yeah, a, it was a, it was a, it was um is it not embossed or debossed? It's when it's like in yeah, yeah. It was debossed into it. I think it was for one of the it was from one of the films. I, I actually I, I put that on eBay. I should have I should have held on to it. I didn't get I thought it would go for loads. I think I got like twenty four. Was it in, was it in Harry Potter? No, no, it was just a promo it was like a promotional yeah. item that was given to I don't know, like maybe cast and crew or something. It was um she she just sort of ended up with you. They they weren't for sale. They were like, yeah, I suppose 
I, I, I was chat. I was chatting to one of my drum students the other day, and he he's just bought one of Voldemort's wands. They they had like about ten wands built. They probably had about fifty. You know, there's probably quite a lot of them. Well, oh yeah, I mean, he, he should have bought two. Really, that would have been incredible. Incredible thing. I, I can remember doing it when I was in IQ. We did a gig with um, Present. You know that? I, I know Present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played with them a couple of times. Yeah, and, they, and the I've, guy. I've just did some vocals with them on. Stage. Really. Yeah, they were a brilliant band. Yeah, but well, they they got the drummer was playing with Barbie dolls. Where were they? Dave playing? Kerman. Yeah, yeah, I made a record with that guy actually. Yeah, we played on a Bob Drake album together. Yeah, he's a, yeah he used to play with dolls. That was one of his. Things. Yeah, he, he was playing with Barbie dolls, but we felt that they sabotaged IQ's sound. Oh really? They might have done. Uh, I don't. Well, I don't. Dave, you, you've got to ask them about this. I, I, I it was it was near fest. IQ I played the like. Fest. Oh, what? Yeah, okay. Yeah, they they went down um, notoriously badly, didn't they? At the Fest. I think it was a. It was a. They came out and they were doing all. They had like the playing them with the dolls and, and and all sorts of weirdness. And it was, and I thought it was amazing because although I've always played on the sort of neo prog thing, I've always been attracted to the more, you know, extreme avant garde end of prog. So I thought it was it was wonderful. And then when we got on stage, we started playing and, and there was just no monitors. And, we, and I was going nuts and the band were going nuts. And when we got back, somebody had gone along and run their finger across, you know, the uh, the orc sends for the monitors. They were just all flat and they couldn't work it, this out. And so us being a neo-prog band, um, we blamed Prezant, Prezant or whatever you say. That's what we did. Or whether that's true or not. But if you know them, it would be wonderful to get under to see whether they did you know, which I don't blame I them. I they 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 went down badly with their Barbie doll drumming, and then IQ come on, and then it's like everyone goes nuts because it's IQ. You know, I could understand. I, 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 I can't know. imagine. I can't. I can't speak for the late uh, Roger Trigo, but um, I I can't imagine because uh, I know those guys. But I know Dave, as I said, pretty well because we, you know we, we we recorded a you know we made this record together with Bob Drake, but um. Uh, I don't know. They're they're really really nice guys. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you've you, you've put that to bed. I, I won't hold on to that anymore. I I, um, that, that, I tell you what, their performance get, carried some sort of like weight because what happened? They were on um, on the Sunday morning, uh, and what they would do, like the the near fest model was, because what I really liked about near fest is they really mixed up the um, you know, they, they would have like the classic classic band, and they'd have like a neo band, they'd have like a avant rock kind of band yeah they, they put the avant rock band on the sunday morning so present present got that but apparently sort of a lot of people left but i played there in 2006 with guapo and we, we thought we were going to get crucified but actually it, it went down really well but the whole gig um that we were playing gary green from gentle giant was in the front row so I was really, really self-conscious. I think, you know, he's amazing. I love Gentle Giant. I think I played in 2005 and, and they said there's some guys from Gentle Giant here. But yeah. So they might, it, it might have been Gary at the gig. That, so that's that's another one of your favourites, is it, Gentle Giant? Well, no, I mean, uh, the, you know, I, I love it all. But I do, the, the, specifically, you know, that for me, the albums, um, I mean, I like it all, but specifically Power and the Glory, um, uh, Interview and Freehand, I just think of, masterpieces yeah my favorite is freehand but it's only because yeah. the first one i heard I, I absolutely love gentle giants it's another yeah. another one of those bands that's got its own world but i have to i have to tell you this is my, one of my favorite things that gary said so we were after the you know after that day uh we stayed up in the bar and sort of hung out with gary for about an hour or so and he was you know telling me that he'd really enjoyed guapo now guapo is like an avant like an instrumental sort of avant rock i suppose you call it you know um and uh, he said, uh, at one point he said, yeah, great band. Uh, I suppose you're familiar with the concept of a day job. Because <laughs> it was it was clearly, there was no way you'd be making a living out of playing that music. I really, I really stopped <laughs> I suppose you're familiar with the concept of a day job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and are you? Painter and decorator to Fiona Bruce. Not, thankfully, as of, as of uh, the age of 48, I've just turned 52, I've been, I've been uh, doing this, whatever this is. But, um, it's up a, until it's then, a strange thing, isn't it, when you do this? I'm, I'm, I'm about to return to it. I think next year. I think um, when that's all come, come with the YouTube, you know, the YouTube's now taking off. But uh, 
Yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a strange thing. I, when I when I played DFS with IQ, it was my second gig with IQ. Wow. And the, you you do a big signing thing after the gig. That that blew my mind. I I'd, I'd never um I'd never really experienced that. I'd never experienced a prog audience before because Cardiac um just really only played in the UK kind of thing. Yeah. They didn't really play those uh I mean, they did this. Pro- in fact, they did a prog festival with IQ. Do you remember Whitchurch? It was before you. Were- yeah, that, I, I mean, the guys in IQ used to did, did a lot of gigs with Cardiacs. Quite yeah, a lot. yeah, back in the. Well, I know Cardiacs borrowed um, uh, Mellotron for the first from, album. From which from Martin Orford, the famous yeah, right. yeah, 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 Mellotron, yeah. yeah. But um, by the time I was doing the well, I, I hadn't really experienced that sort of prog audience. It wasn't until Guapo going to the US, uh, specifically because of Neofest. And. Um, that, that I saw, saw it, and we had this whole thing with the queue, and they said, "Oh, you've got to come and do this signing." We were yeah. Like, so, but, man, it was <laughs> it's strange, right? And it went on for ages. And the thing ages, was, yeah. I I just joined the band, and I'm not I've not played on any of the albums. So all the IQ guys are lined up, and then a hundred people are walking past who are all anal retentive prog fans, and it was literally they were going on, and they go. The Weege, can you sign that, Mike? Can you sign that, Pete? Can you sign that, John? Can you sign that? And then literally, if I just grab a record here, it was literally like um, they they would go. Um, oh, okay. literally, all for about an hour and a half of nobody letting me sign it. And I was going, can I sign one of these? And they would go, you're not on it. You're not on yeah. it. Like, yeah, I know I can sign yeah, it for you. Neofest had a very specific, you know, very particular audience, which is a uh, male uh, audience of a certain sort of persuasion. But it's the strangest thing signing um, records that you're not on. I mean, I have to sign Steve Hillage albums and Gong albums. But I first experienced it, and this is quite timely. Um, in the 90s, I was playing in a band with three of the guys out of the Pogues, uh, Spider Stacy, Andrew Rankin, and the, the late da- uh, Daryl Hunt. And we did a tour of the of France. And I, they were asking me to sign records that I was at school at when they were made, you know. And it's, it's really weird. It's like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to devalue this if, if I sign it. But you know, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's it, it's a it's a strange thing. So what what what's what's next for you, 2024? What have you got happening next year? Well, um, we have release wise, we've got a, a Utopia Strong BBC sessions coming out in January. Um, which we recorded, I think it was last, yeah, end of last year, which was really nice. Um, then I finished my second solo album, and it's all mastered, and it's I'm just wait. In fact, the guy who's helping me release it is uh, one of the mem- current members of Angel Witch, uh, of all things. And uh, uh, so two two of my pals play in Angel Witch now, um, Will Palmer and Jimmy Martin. Um, I, and, I loved uh, them when I was a kid because they just they played their first gig at the weekend last weekend they played in I think the Netherlands first gig since before COVID um, I don't know who the drummer is but it's Jimmy on guitar second guitar and it's just it's Kevin you know um, and then my friend Will plays bass and uh, yeah they did their first first post COVID gig but I've seen some YouTube stuff it looks brilliant so I really want I to think, see it. it's incredible I mean it was like 1980. I bought Axe Attack. That was the album. That I've got that. I've got that. Axe Attack. And then I needed more. So I went down and I bought Metal for Mothers, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And on Volume 1, Angel Witch did Baphomet. And it, it's that was just on that when I heard that. And it was my me wanting to go to the darkness of King Crimson and Omavish Nook. that's what I was searching for. Yeah, yeah. And I was listening to Def Leppard and White Snake and all that. And then when I heard Baphomet by Angel Witch, whoa, just the darkest, heaviest thing. Then I got into Venom and I had all that, you know, that thing. And then have you have you read the read, uh, the, the Norban book, uh, Denim and Leather? Oh, it's no. really, oh, you've got to read it. It's amazing. It's really, really good. It's um oh, I've got it down there somewhere. It's it's, it's very it's really good. It came out last year, Denim and Leather, and it's the uh, they they sort of into, Iron Maiden. Annoying. It's a shame actually. Iron Maiden don't get interviewed, although Paul Diano does, and I think Dennis Stratton as well. But um you've got um one of the guys from Angel, which not Kevin, which is a shame. But um a bit a lot about Diamond Head, a lot about Venom, a lot about uh, Def Leppard, who are great. They're really. Uh, Joe Joe Elliott's got such a. a They're amazing. They they, they, they they you know on through the night all that I loved all that you know. Um, I mean, uh, Diamond Head Brian Tatler he's literally uh, I met him a number of times because he literally lives just up the road from me. He's just got the gig with he's, Saxon. He's got he's Saxon, up, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. 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 And I I'd, I'd quite like to get Brian on the 
the channel because he's a massive prog fan, and that's the well, thing. Yeah, clearly, clearly, it's yeah. that thing again. Is yeah. that, that that it was like New Wave of British Heavy Metal really was punk. It was it was like metal going or rock music going. Well, punk is out doing us a little bit. I, and I, then I, prog. I, Michael Han is the name of the author, um, and I really, really recommend it. If you like rock biogs, which I do, it, it's really good. And it, it, it posits just that. And it, it, this is like, like real working class music, you know. And oh, was, totally. And, 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 and that's what I loved about it when, it when I was a kid, is I knew it was like contrarian and it wasn't yeah. cool. I didn't, I, I mean, all that stuff that was going on, like Joy Division at the same time, but I wasn't into that because I, it all smelt a little bit art student. I was an art student, you know. Yeah. And they were all listening to the Smiths and the Cure and Joy Division. I love, I, I love heavy metal, you know, and it was, it was a big, it was, you know, a big one for me. Um, I mean, I, I also do love like the Smiths and Joy Division and stuff. But I, I, no, I, I, heavy metal was such a, a big one for me, and um, I could go into actually how that really has affected the way I sort of feel about music because w- two, two things about heavy metal, I think, is you've got to be sincere. It's an absolutely sincere art form, you know. And also, you're, you're marginalised. So you, it's all. It was always uncool. You know, metal was never. There was never any cool. You weren't going to like meet girls or something through metal. So therefore, you know, you. It, it, I, I was already used to being uncool. You know, I was already used to just uh, tying my. You know, flat, flat, n- nailing my flag to an uncool post, and then also, what I love about heavy metal is. You've got to have chops, but it's not about chops. It's not like sort of um it's I mean, I know there's a now a strain to it, which is, but like you've got to be really you've got to be as good as you possibly can. So it's not it's not a lazy form of music. It's not like a kind of uh, you know, oh, that'll do. You know, you know it, it, and any of that really gets sort of like found out, you know, death to false metal. So I, I think it really it imbues in you a real sincerity about music and 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 not wanting to be ironic about it or just oh that'll do. It, I, I think there's some, it, it's like a people's folk music, but there's definitely something about heavy metal that really like informed just you know just the way I play and the aggression of it and and everything you know. Oh, there's, a, there's a whole. I have met like uh, uh, classical musicians, jazz musicians, fusion musicians, prog musicians. And it all goes back to 1980 and the new wave of British heavy metal. It, it was for our age group. It was the birthing place of all sorts of stuff. And and I and I don't know what it is about that music, but it seemed to open the door to all sorts of different music. Yeah, because yeah, like, yeah, totally. I because you were searched out these bands that you had to put Tommy Vance on Friday Rock Show, and they and, you know, and I would just if it, here's a budgie record, and then here's and I would check it all out, you know, because. I, I suddenly became aware of this otherness that was there in in the world because of of the new wave of British heavy metal. It, it was so I powerful. Totally agree, man. And and for me, like with, with Iron Maiden as a as a kid, it, it, again talk about a band that really had this world. I mean, now, yeah, okay, you know, so looking at them now, it's like, oh yeah, they use the same three chords, and yeah, they're just some guys who are into like football and fishing and stuff. But at the time, there's this like had this real magic to it. With that Derek Riggs artwork and the blue and the yellow color scheme, and the fact is that yeah, okay, on one level, you you could sort of say well, con- compositionally it, it's stunted in a way maybe. Although I, I love those tunes, I mean they they were certainly a lot more interesting in the eighties. They used to modulate a lot more and and have all these lovely dense guitar harmonies, which they don't sort of seem to do anymore. But what I love about Iron Maiden is five guys doing absolutely the best they possibly can with the tools that they've got. It's every single one of them pushing themselves to the complete limit. Bruce is singing in those days, and Nico's drumming, or the bass playing, all of it. It's just, it's five guys doing the absolute best they can with, with all the influence they've got available. And you you really hear it, you know, it, it really, really got, gets to you. In the, and, you know, it doesn't need to be more complicated. Or No, it's a, they're, they're just, I mean, it's, it's such a weird thing of, you know, getting up on a Saturday morning, putting on Tiz was. Iron Maiden come on, and and they play Run to the Hills, and then in the middle of the Run to the Hills, I can remember watching it Saturday morning, and when Bruce does that, <laughs> where's it going? It's like, what the hell's this? Oh, I'm getting goosebumps even thinking about it. It's, yeah, I'm just like, thinking you get goosebumps. Murray's solo with all the, I mean, I love Brian Setzer, but... You know, it's it's jazz. You know, sets there's bits of jazz in there and bluegrass and country. 
Murray sort of that just seems so atonal. It was like the gates of hell open. It's the gates of hell, yeah. And, and, and a song about Native <laughs> Americans on the side of the Native Americans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, who else would write songs like that? You know, everyone's writing songs about love and, get, you know, chatting people up. And yeah. they've been made writing songs about, like, you know, trains or, like, an expedition to the North Pole or some bizarre, yeah, you know. I love it. <laughs> it it's, it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. I like the, I, for me, I, I like the sort of the, the mystical ones. For me, like sort of uh, purgatory and infinite dreams and, um, you know, and, and anything that, like Moonchild. That's why I like Seventh Son lyrically, because there was no songs about war. I mean, I, I love Maiden, but I was like, oh, enough war already, man. War, war's boring. I want, I want mysterious Crowley Lovecraft shit, you know. I want some of that <laughs> dream. So... Uh, what I was going to say, so I've got a new solo album coming out um, early next year. I think it's the best record I've made. Um, it's certainly the most work I've ever put into a, a record. Um, and then I have a big project, which I'm performing at a festival called Roadburn in April, which is going to have two drummers, bass, uh, synths and woodwinds and stuff, which I'm working on. And then I've got more, uh, more Gong and more Utopia Strong stuff uh, next year, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to come out and see you. And uh, when the when your solo album comes out, you're going to come back on, and I'll do a review. And then oh, I'd love to. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get you a. I can. Uh, yeah, I'll have, a, I'll have a good listen to. I find it hard to listen to music now, but I really want to use the channel to put music out like that, and I really want to be able to give it a good two weeks of listening to, so I can get into it. So I'll definitely do that. And uh, I'm, it's been lovely talking to you, Carpus, and I hope I we can now say that we're friends. Are we friends now? We are totally friends now. Bro. We're friends now, aren't we? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I, like, brilliant. I just want to hang out more, you know. Yeah, yeah. We got, we've got to do it. We've got to do it. And and if the next time you you you're chatting with Steve Davis, tell him he really needs to come on my channel. I'm I've seeing shown you know. my snooker knowledge. I've got the snooker knowledge. I've got the prog knowledge. I'm not so good on magma and all that stuff. I've got to be honest. I've, I'm magma's another band that I I. Well, I'll tell you what, he's he's at where he's at now is uh, electronic music. It's electronic, yeah. I, 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 I'm all right with that, you know. I don't want to talk about. You know? Yeah, and I and I and I really I really want to give. Um, I really want to get into what he actually does on the albums because um, that is really interesting to me because obviously he's he's got this big input, but it, it, it's like I want to know about what, what how he's arrived at that because it, it's it's just started. I'm I'm having the conversation that with him that I should have. So his journey towards becoming a musician is very interesting. I mean, strange but interesting. That well, I'm seeing him on Thursday. We're DJing together in Cheltenham on that's our last engagement of the year, <clears throat> and so I'm seeing him on Thursday. And I think I'm going to stay up there and because he's just we we both been near each other now. Um, he's in uh he's in Bristol. I'm in I'm in Glastonbury. So I think I'm going to stay there for a couple of days, you know, hang out. So I will definitely. Um, yes, and say hello to him and say I, I, I just find it such a fascinating story, and 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 God, he was a monster player. He <laughs> he was unbelievable. He was invincible in the eighties. That guy. Well, you'll find him. He's he's so easy. He's very very easy company, you know. And so it'll be a you know I I in a way I don't want to sort of don't want to damn damn him by saying he's sort of so down to earth but he really you know I, I find him very very easy company but then he's quite a he, he's like he's like you know what well, dare i say us he's a nerd you know oh i love it yeah i i, I just find i find it a fascinating story and I, i'm gonna have to go now i think uh um, I've got I've got to go and pick my kids up from school, so I, I, I do I do need to uh, um, uh, go now. It's been lovely talking to you. I will. Uh, and you. Thank and you I'll, so. I'll I'll now stop the recording. And so, do you want to say bye to the, all the viewers at home? Bye bye. bye. But if you keep waving, I can stop it while you're waving, Carvers. If you just keep waving. bye 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 bye. <laughs>